Welcome to our daily devotion. The Methodist Church of Barbados invites you to sing, pray, and worship with us as we declare God's glory and celebrate His mighty acts. Brothers and sisters, as we gather for another daily devotion, let us go to God in prayer. Most gracious and loving God, we give you praise and thanks for your continued grace and mercy upon our lives. We praise you, dear God, for giving us Jesus Christ our Lord, our Savior, and who through Him we have been able to be restored, redeemed, and to be a part of your kingdom here on earth. We count it, O oh God, nothing but a privilege. And, O oh God, we recognize, O oh God, that through Him we now owe you, dear God, our everything. And so, as we come, O oh God, we confess that at times we lose sight of this. At times, O oh God, we, in so many ways, seek to put other things and others above you. Even though, O oh God, you have given it all and sacrificed it all for us. So, God, we seek your forgiveness, your cleansing, your healing. And, O oh God, that you ask that you will create in us a clean heart and renew the right spirit within us. And, O oh God, we thank you for this opportunity to reflect in your word and to reflect on your word and to be challenged and edified to continued service to the glory of your name. So, bless our time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The scripture reading this evening is taken from Matthew chapter 6, reading verses 25 to 33. It reads, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. 
they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not of more value than they and can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life and why do you worry about clothing consider the lilies of the field how they grow they neither toil nor spin yet i tell you even solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these but if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry saying what we will eat or what we will drink or what we will wear, for it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise be to Christ our Lord. silver or gold I'd rather be his than have riches untold I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land yes I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world Be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. Yes, I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be. God, thank you for your word, which is lamp to our feet and light to our path. Now bless your word unto our hearts and glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Once I was on, a, on an outreach in a community where I approached a guy to pray for him. After finished praying for him, he then asked me to place my hands on his shoulder to pray for him again but this time I must pray specifically for him to get a new job for him to be able to provide for his physical needs and this encounter um, has been ever so 
etched in my memory because of how the issue of physical needs is a very serious matter to the average human being. The questions concerning what I will eat, drink or wear, where will I live, or how are the bills going to be paid, confront us every day. It confronts in a greater way those of us who are unemployed, in financial debt, or have children to provide for, or are pressured by the hard economic times. Therefore, making light of how important physical needs are is to be naive. When we read the Bible, we realize that God does not minimize it either. It is a topic that is dealt with several times in the New Testament alone. In Jesus' teaching, he saw the need to help us to appreciate how his followers should relate to material possessions. In other words, Jesus was showing his disciples that if we are going to live a life pleasing to God, that, that physical needs cannot be ignored, but they must, it must be put in its rightful place. One such teaching is found in the famous Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 to 7. Particularly in chapter 6, Jesus tackles this issue in a direct way from verse 19 to the end. In verses 19 to 21, Jesus speaks about the fact that as his followers, as important as material things are for basic survival and for physical security, we must not make them the aim of our lives. We must not make the aim of our lives to acquire them, neither must we make them the primary investment of our future. Because he tells us that it is these things that can get rust, can build up moth, and can even come to a point where they are no longer existent. In other words, they are temporary and can be taken away or lost at any time. In verse 24, he goes on to say, well, no one can serve two masters. Is either you would become a slave and hate one and love the other or devote to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Jesus is saying to us that if we don't relate properly to these things that our daily needs, they can become our masters and divide our allegiance and priority that should be given fully to God. I mean, think of it. The average Christian does not deliberately set out to serve two masters or dethrone God from number one. Rather, it is the compelling need to ensure that these basic needs are met or fair of if we don't have that many times we believe that God must understand why I need to do this or why I need to dedicate most of my time to my job or livelihood, or why my child's education is the most important thing. God would understand when we only seek him continually in prayer, only when our physical survival is being threatened. In fact, sometimes God often becomes in our lives a means to our ends and our goals. So it is out of this that Jesus then says in verse 25, Therefore, he's saying, It is as a result of all of these things that I am offering you this counsel. This, this counsel. And he says, Do not worry about your life. And he specifies these physical needs. See, the word worry comes from a Greek word that means to be pulled apart or divided into two parts. So Jesus is saying, don't allow the physical aspects of your life to cause so much concern that it causes you to be distracted from having your mind and heart set on God and God alone. You see, Jesus says, don't worry. Is, is sometimes maybe challenging for us because we may say, Jesus, well, you don't understand my situation. 
Jesus, you, you, you're not aware of the magnitude of my financial distress. But can I tell you that the people, many of the people who he was speaking to in those days were living from paycheck to paycheck. Many of them were daily paid workers. Many of them were poor. But Jesus offers some reasons why we shouldn't worry. He says, Life is more than physical needs. Verse 25b. She said, to, to, We should not live only to provide and meet physical needs because that's just the bare minimum of life. Life is actually more than that. He goes on to tell us that also in verse 26, that God values us and cares for us far more than he cares for the birds. And he says, but look at the birds. They are taken care of. That God cares for us and values us more than the lilies out there. And he says, look at them. God takes care of them. He says, the grass that is clothed. And he says, God takes care of all of nature so well. And will not God take care of us? He says, why shouldn't we worry? He said, we should not worry because worry does not help us in any way. Verse 27. He says, we should not worry because God knows that we need all these things. Therefore, he says, in essence, trust God. You have little faith. We must trust God. And then he goes on to say, do not, it is the Gentiles who strive after these things. It is the Gentiles who, who seeks to make life about and center life around things that will perish. Where, where most of our effort and time and energy is dedicated to thinking and finding more ways to ensure and, and to ensure that we are physically secure. He said, don't go the way of the Gentiles. Then he says, but, a contrast, rather go this way. Rather than strive for these things, strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, the alternative way is, is to take our focus and attention of those things that are temporal, those things that, that can waste away, those things that will perish, and devote our lives to the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Does this mean to give up our jobs? No, not necessarily. Does this mean to stop budgeting? No. Does this mean to stop investing? No. Does it mean to does it mean don't take too seriously my son's or daughter's education? No. Does it mean doing only church work? No. So kingdom of God, strive for the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Now the kingdom of God is not necessarily speaking only to a place where God reigns. Because the truth is God reigns in a heaven. That's where God's will is always done and God has full reign. But God does not, in other words, God's will is not fully done here on earth. So God doesn't have full reign here, here on earth because of our disobedience. But the kingdom of God is more about God's sovereign and saving activity in the world or wherever he is. It's more about his activity rather than a place. And so God's saving activity in the world has been manifested to us and glorified through the crucified and resurrected Christ. And so the good news that came many years ago and the good news that is to us today is that Jesus is king. That through his crucifixion and his resurrection, that he is king and he is Lord. And that anyone who believes in this good news invites God's reign and rule in their lives. Where God comes in and transforms our lives to be able to submit to him and give him full allegiance. And he now becomes the center of our lives. So striving for the kingdom of God first means that we are ambassadors for the kingdom living in this world. So then we are called to represent and promote the values of the kingdom, the purpose and mission in our jobs, in our homes, in the supermarket 
at school and the sporting field, wherever we go. In other words, our heart's desire now and our first priority will always be to remember that we are kingdom citizens and that wherever we go, we are no longer people of the world, but we are, we are placed wherever to represent the kingdom. So no matter where we are, who we are, we now understand that our primary duty is to represent and advance the kingdom. Whether it will be accepted or not, favorable or not, whether it will bring persecution or not, it doesn't matter that our allegiance is to our new king and that is King Jesus. It means that all of our possessions are now to be seen as tools for the kingdom's advancement. So no longer is the, the money that the, we get and all the different things that we have in our lives should be seen and should be selfishly um, guarded and, and kept for ourselves. But these things are now to be given over to God for the use for the kingdom's advancement. That's why I said earlier, to strive for the kingdom of God first does not mean to automatically give up your job. It can mean that you go to work no longer focusing on the picture or advancing my dreams and aspirations to move up the ladder. But we go to our job every day with the number one priority to represent the kingdom through the way we love our co-workers and stand up for the values of the kingdom. Sometimes, as a result of you representing the kingdom, you may be fired, or you realize that you could no longer stay in this job because it contradicts the values of the kingdom. Therefore, we will be willing to give it up because we are no longer relying on ourselves for provision, but on God's promise that he will add all things unto us. And his righteousness. Righteousness is to be in right relationship with God and man. So we rely on Jesus to be our righteousness through faith. Everything is through Christ and in Christ and for Christ now in our lives. Our number one priority and desire is to please God. And therefore, we are constantly working to build and maintain our relationship with God in everything. So we have to be now protective that nothing or no one encourages us to lose our dependence upon God. We must prioritize, use our time for spiritual growth, Bible study and prayer and fasting. We must seek to be obedient to God in all things, in our decision making, in our everyday living, in everything. And we must seek to love, God, love others as God has loved us. And brothers and sisters, God has given us a promise that if we honor him by placing him first in this way, he says all these things, don't have to worry about them because he says all these things will be added to us. So it's a life of faith, a life of faith where we are now putting our provisions into God's hands. We are now relying upon God to give us our daily bread. See, it is tempting to make physical security and our immediate needs, our end all and be all, to the point that we just use God to achieve this for us. But Jesus calls us, brothers and sisters, to abandon self-preservation and self-security and find our security and purpose in God and in God's ways. And so, the songwriter tells us so profoundly, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. Rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be his and be led by his nail-pierced hands. And so I pray that you will seek to strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Amen.
please receive the benediction. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. for being a part of our daily devotion. We trust it has been a blessing to you. Now together, let us hold fast to his word and may it dwell in all of us richly.